Welcome to Empire Building, where we talk about building big businesses and even bigger lives. I'm your co-host, Seychelle Van Poole. I'm Via Williams. Today, we're going to talk with Ellen Curtis, the Vice President of Operations at Keller Williams International, the largest real estate company in the world. I am so excited to talk to Ellen today and really go through her journey and the lessons of one of the youngest female senior leadership executives in the real estate industry. And and I think what's cool about Ellen and what I'm really excited for you guys to learn about is her journey of motherhood and and having a family in the middle of all this and and what it looks like. And I know Seychelle, I know you and Ellen go way back and I think you guys started at Keller Williams in the same year, is that right? We did, can you believe that? (laughs) That was in 2004. (laughs) <laughs> you guys yeah. were babies we were babies <laughs> and it seems like it doesn't that seem like lifetimes ago ellen like, it does it does like ages <laughs> but it's also passed in a flash yes. you know it's also passed in a flash so well you guys were both like 23 years old or something like that ellen mm-hmm. you know let's what started what got you at keller williams what what brought you from tulane university to keller williams um <laughs> Well, a variety of events. I moved to Austin, Texas because I had met people from Texas when I evacuated from a hurricane once from New Orleans, for those who are uh, Tulane, who don't know Tulane's in New Orleans. And we had evacuated to Austin. And then everyone I met from Texas was so crazy for Texas. And you understand this dynamic, Seychelle, because you're from Texas. Yes. There's something weird about being from Texas. Like you just glom onto it, right? (laughs) Part of your identity in a way that many other places do not. And I thought that's a place, that's a crazy place. I'm going to move there, right? I'm from a small town in Tennessee, uh, no stoplights, very small town, less than a thousand people. And I was not going to go back there. That was not (laughs) in my game plan. (laughs) And so I thought I had one friend, I thought I'd move to Austin. And um, I took a job, if you want to call it that, it was really more of an internship, an unpaid internship at the Chamber of Commerce. And I would set out the Cokes and Cookies for meetings um, and talk to business leaders that were coming in for committee meetings and different things. And I got a very random connection over to Keller Williams to do some freelance writing because I'm a, I, I had a marketing communications degree and background and that's huh. really kind of my passion. And, um, so I took a freelance writing gig, um, and that kind of opened the door to, to my Keller Williams story. <laughs> wow. And so you were working for the chamber of commerce got a freelance writing gig, and then that turned into your full-time position with Keller Williams. So what what did Keller Williams International look like when you started with the company? Yeah, it's funny. We It looked very different. We were probably, <laughs> um, at that time, somewhere around 30 to 35,000 agents. Um, wow. And there were, I don't know, 50 or so people at headquarters. It was, it was just a, we were number five or number six in the industry as far as agent count went. And it was a different, I had no idea. I mean, I, I just had no idea um, what, that I was getting a seat on a rocket ship, right? There yeah. was no, I, I was too young to even understand that or even be getting toward that or angling toward that or strategizing. Sure. I just was desperate for money and a job. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, what I tell people a lot now too is like, research the company you're going for and make sure you get a seat on a rocket ship because that that could end up being the next, you know this, Seychelle, the next 15, 16 years of your life all of a sudden in the blink of an eye because you chose the right company. I dumb lucked into it, you know, but but um, it, it was well, very different. Well, there may have been, there may have been luck that got you here, but there's been <laughs> a lot of intention in staying. Yes, right. Like, yes. I think that that's part of it too. I love I love that advice though. Make sure you get a seat on a rocket ship. Mm-hmm. for uh, somebody coming out of school. I think that's really a cool way of putting how Keller Williams looked, right? Mm-hmm. When when you first were joining on. But that time, at that time too, guys, Gary was personally approving every hire. Yes. And that's Gary Keller, day. our founder and CEO. Yeah. Yep. Gary Keller was personally approving every hire. And so I found myself kind of negotiating my salary directly with Gary. And he wanted to pay me $23,000 because I was 23 <laughs> years old. <laughs> Which, did you accept it? Did you negotiate? I negotiated because I got an offer from a nonprofit, believe it or not, that was like $32,000. <laughs> nice. Like, 
I'm going to go negotiate and I'm going to get $32,000. And so that is what I did. And I got, it was this uh, <laughs> person in the marketing department. <laughs> That so, is so that's awesome. what's cool is that you started off, you know, you, you started off in marketing and now here you are vice president of operations. Mm-hmm. And, and in the course of that journey, you went on to become the vice president of operations for Keller Williams worldwide. Is that right? That's right. That's right. So I did just, you know, a, a brief overview of the history as I did uh, 12 years of my Keller Williams career in the marketing communication Mm -hmm. department. I was the second person I was, uh, writing and then that evolved and that was its own journey. Um, but as I was doing that job and it really was, I was coming to a point where I was kind of going, okay, what's next? What is the next thing? Right. And our worldwide expansion was really kicking into high gear. And we had brought on some other wonderful leaders in the industry to help drive that. Bill Sutteroff, who who leads that organization. And they came and asked me to partner on operations for that organization. And I'm a traveler. I love to travel around the world. My husband and I traveled all the time. And I just think that the the models and systems that Keller Williams was built on, I couldn't wait to take those to the rest of the real estate world. And so I did that for five or six years. Um, and then when I was seven months pregnant, uh, Gary Keller and Josh Team, our president, came back to me and said, hey, would you be interested in uh, joining us as our vice president of operations back on the North American side? And so um, that's what I did. So... I have a question because there's a big time gap, right? There's a huge time span of 12 years in the marketing department. And Mm -hmm. when you started with Keller Williams International, you were single, right? Mm -hmm. Like kind of new, new out of school, year or two out of college, right? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden I hear I was married and then I was pregnant. So (laughs) kind of why that's like a lot life-wise to go through. And so I want to back up on the personal side for a little bit, because I know you personally have worked your tail off in this Mm -hmm. career. Mm-hmm. And so for somebody, for somebody who hears all the time, you can have it all, all the time. What, what are some of the trade-offs that you feel like you have seen between having an amazing career, right? And, and creating and launching your career and also building a strong marriage and a family. Like what, what does that actually look like? Well, I, I, that's such a hard question to answer, right? That it, because it looks different for everybody. I can tell you what sure. it looked like for me and I can mm-hmm. only share my perspective on it, which is that I worked six, six days a week. I mean, mm-hmm. I really did. I work an extra day. And I think if you work an extra day every week, you gradually get ahead of people who are working, you know, five days a week, right? There's, there's no Mm -hmm. way around that is that you just get more hours in, you get more time on task, you get more focus time. And so eventually that work, just the results of that work just started to show up and there were sacrifices in that, right? If you're working Mm -hmm. six days a week, I wasn't um, putting myself as in as many situations to date, to mingle, right? (laughs) By the way, there were dating apps then you had to like go right. out and meet and people which you had to physically high. be there yeah no, definitely. <laughs> and and I was way more into working than I was into going out and trying to meet people so um I I think time on task just built that over time and I really cared about what we were doing you know you don't do that just because you want to advance your career you do yeah. it because you also care and feel like the work you're doing is meaningful absolutely it, and so I did that, but that had that had a delayed effect on some of the relationship building that I did in my life, right? I've always yeah. had great friendships um, and a small circle, and I always prioritized those, but I definitely didn't wasn't out and about and putting myself in a situation to meet a life partner as often. Yeah. So how and did so, you meet them? Uh, we, well, uh, we met at Wahoo's Fish Tacos for those of you who, uh, (laughs) um, I had, this is a little bit embarrassing, but talking about being strategic, maybe this is helpful. Uh, (laughs) I was going out with one of my girlfriends at the time to during world cup soccer games, Mm -hmm. because we had decided that meeting guys that that watch soccer, um, they were like a cut above your normal guy. Yes. So, They're a little bit more sophisticated, understand yeah, strategy. More, yep. Yeah, <laughs> more worldly. Yeah. 
It's so I weird that we, we were at Wahoo's Fish Tacos watching the U.S. versus Ghana um, soccer match, and uh, he sat down beside me. Wow. It's totally Congrats. random. It's history. Totally random. Wow. Yeah. And, but, but that was, you know, in my early 30s, right? I had already right. been working for 10 years, and I had not dated a lot, honestly, during that mm-hmm. time. And I'm not saying that anyone else should do that. I'm just saying that's sure. what that's my, what you That's what your path looked like. And that's... What the path looked like, yeah. I think it's so helpful, though, for people to understand that in your career, part of the, part of the secret was not just this magical, like easy button or this pill that you can take that just gets there. It was, it was, you out hustled. Well, exactly. And if and you, you put hear, the energy and the time and the dedication in on it, it's time on task, right? It's time and focus on task. Like anything is that if you have enough time on it, the nail will go in. If you hammer, mm. hammer, hammer, the nail will go in. And, and I think about, you know, a lot of the learnings and things we've heard about, you know, Kobe Bryant, especially since his mm-hmm. passing, yes. right. Is that he always stayed at practice longer. He always yeah. took more shots than anyone else. He always made sure that every his competition knew he was working harder, right. He was very right. public about it. And I think that's true of anything. If you want to get ahead, you're going to have to work smarter or harder. There's no way around it. That's fair. <laughs> you know my, uh, my sophomore son said to me last night that it's really interesting on this topic because I also work six days a week and I, I work hard in bringing my family in to that. I, mm-hmm. they, they understand what mom does. And I, I, I've i always frameworked work as, as a blessing and a privilege, not like mm-hmm. I have to go to work. I'm really careful about my words. And last night I said, how are you doing in school with the whole um, homeschool thing that's happening right now? And he said, um, not as well as I'd like mom, because I see you working really hard and I want to love something so much that I work that hard. And I, I even see you working when we're watching movies and I want to be like that. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was one of those moments where I was like, gosh, my mom guilt's kind of erased right now. You know, my, my kids are watching and, and this isn't oh, all. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, my internal self is sometimes beating myself up and maybe you guys feel the same way. And, and to hear my kids saying, I aspire to that. And I see, they see what we're doing. And so this mm. isn't always bad that we work hard, you know, as a role model for our kids. And you've got to, you've got to see the fruits of that, right? I mean, mm-hmm. and you have to believe in what you're working toward. And I think I had no concept of that when I was doing that. I just, right. it, I didn't mind it. I thought I'm working hard. I'm getting ahead. I'm young. Now's the time. But it really is important that you have to find a purpose, a goal you can believe in, a culture you can plug into and find comfort in. Like you have to have something there that drives that or else it will be empty. I mean, and it'll just, it'll feel hard. Um, So I'm grateful. I'm grateful that I had that and that the organization I happened into, I could plug into that and make no mistake. You have to do the work. (laughs) That's fair. And so I'm going to ask a question that I think Via and I hear a lot, and I'm going to ask it of you too, which is being a female in business in a leadership position is not as common as we see in males. Mm -hmm. Did that, like growing up, going into the leadership positions like you have, were there um, any insecurities that you had to overcome on the path to that? Of course. I mean, I have, I have insecurities that are around where I come from, right? Yeah. I'm a small town girl. I used to have, I mean, probably a lot of people listening to this are going to say she has a Southern accent. You should have heard me 15 years ago. I can vouch. Okay? I can vouch. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had some twang, okay? And <laughs> so you have those insecurities of just where you come from and whether or not you can become this this powerful, uh, confident, sophisticated business person and to mm-hmm. do that, and that you're worthy of that opportunity and that you, um, can own that opportunity. And then, you know, there are, there are, and that's a big thing. And then yeah. there are trivial things like I'm really short. <laughs> <laughs> hey, dynamite comes in small packages, woman. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yes. I, and you walk in a room and people are, are they go, Oh, that's not what you were expecting. And mm-hmm. so I use it now. I make a little joke when, because oftentimes I still get this. I could talk to somebody on the mm-hmm. phone or my assistant sets an appointment for me and they don't see me come in from a mile away. Right. Yes. So I walk into the room and I go, I know what you're thinking. You thought I'd be taller. 
<laughs> right? Because they're like, I wasn't expecting this younger. I mean, I'm not as young as I used to be, but younger, <laughs> smaller person, you know, and, and you just have to kind of own that. Right. And so I've definitely overcome those. And then we have all the things, right. Am I smart enough? Am I good enough? Um, and Do you feel like those have gotten even bigger, like, or like those have changed even as you've gone into marriage and motherhood and working, have those insecurities changed at all? I feel like, like to give you perspective, mine got bigger. Like I felt yeah. like I was nailing the business thing. And then all of a sudden I like had kid, you know, our daughter. And I was like, oh yeah, I thought I knew what I was doing. I have no idea what I am doing. <laughs> like trying to juggle it. Is, how do you fight those inner battles then? How do yeah. you, what do you do with that? You know, I think you just have to, um, I'm a big, you know, just dress up and show up and put on your armor, whatever that looks like for you Love it. and go because the minute you know, for me, and I think it might be the same for you too. And anybody who's really trying to build an empire is that you, you have gotten to a point, maybe not where you've mastered it, but you can break through the, the fear of taking the next step. Mm -hmm. Like you're just like, okay, I'm just going to put on, you know, my favorite sweater. I'm just going to go, I'm just going to hit play. I'm just going to put on my high heels and go, or I'm just going to start, or I'm just going to ask the question. And if you can get past that, initial barrier, natural momentum kind of takes over and you go, okay, I can do the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. So what was going through your head when, when they tapped you on the shoulder and Gary and Josh said, we, we want you to come be vice president of operation, you know, for the entire company in North America. What, what, what's the self-talk happening? Um, well, I, God, I hope that they don't listen to this maybe, but <laughs> because I don't want them to know what was really going on in my head. My first thought was, of course, this job is mine. I've earned it. And I, if anybody else takes it, I will. And they didn't just give it to me, by the way. I mean, of course, we, we, we had discussions and, and Josh and I particularly had to decide to partner together. And we wanted to know what that working dynamic would look like. Which Absolutely. Is right. So we had to make that decision together. Um, but I was really pregnant guys. I mean, I was, I was seven months. And then as we talked more, I was eight months pregnant. I was getting to her toward my maternity leave, which meant that I would take this job and then come back to it wow. basically yeah. after I had my daughter. And so, um, it was, there were definitely moments where like, it's not the right time. Is this the right mm. time for me to step into this? Or is my family going to be harmed by this, which is a huge mm. fear, right? Like, am I prioritizing myself over my family? And what I ultimately came to, honestly, and maybe it's a competitiveness that's in me, but I was like, if someone else gets this job after 15 years that I have put into this company this, and mm-hmm. to myself and to knowing the things that I know, I will be devastated. I will mm. be devastated. And will that harm my family more because I won't, because I'll always wonder what could have been. Yeah. Right. Oh, than, yeah. than doing it. And so that's ultimately what I came to, but I flip-flopped a few times, like, you know, in those, in those days and weeks of going like, I'm, you know, I really love what I'm doing now. And I'm about to go have a baby and I'm just trying to have a baby. Like, I don't, I don't want to have you know, this pregnancy right yeah. now. <laughs> back then, I look back and back then, I think what's amazing about you is you were toting babies on international trips to launch yes. international markets. I was doing, I had done recruiting pitches. I took my son and I did a recruiting event in uh, Nicaragua. Um, I danced on stage seven months pregnant in Portugal and France. I mean, we (laughs) did like, we did some wild stuff, but it was, that's just part of who I am. I mean, I just want to go see the world. And I think seeing the world is such a eye-opening and humbling Mm -hmm. um, experience. And I want my kids to know it. Wow. Did you have any questions when you were doing international? Because I know your son was itty bitty at that point. Mm-hmm. Did how did you work out that plan to be able to do as much international travel as you did? I mean, you were on the road for weeks yeah, what's the a hack? year. I mean, like, what how, the- how did you how did you do that? You. Like take physically, what did you do? Just take them with you. Did you have help that came with you? Mm-hmm. Did you have so they just went with you everywhere you went? I have an amazing, amazing husband. I mean, it cannot be understated, right? And mm. I think that I got really, um, I got a good one, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how to say it, but he, he doesn't. And I know this doesn't exist in every family, but like, he's not filling in when I'm not there. He's, yeah. 
present. Like we're both in it. Like he's doing right. it right now. Like he's it right yeah. while I'm talking to you guys. Yeah. And, yeah. and so we just make that work and, and we have leverage in our, in our day-to-day lives. Like we have different things. We've got daycare, we've got help. We've got other things that we lean on to help make that work. Sure, but, sure. You know, we just did it. And again, it's not so scary if you take the first step, if you get them on that first international flight, like there's no way off. Yeah, all the way through. <laughs> you just have to make the commitment to walk on the plane, and you're committed. <laughs> right, you're you're in, and so we just we just did it. But yeah, and I didn't. Let's be fully transparent. Like I did a couple trips where I took them with me, and then I didn't travel much that first year. I'm a real Got believer it. in the first year and what it does for their brain development, their mm-hmm. emotional development, and so. I just that first year is really critical. So you know, we either took them or I didn't go. Yeah. Well, that's great. But so you, you get to prioritize yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Great. Can you think of a big failure you had along the way in your career and maybe what, what was one of the most important things you learned from that? Gosh, I've had so many. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I think it was funny because Bea and I were texting and she was asking about superpowers and, um, and I gave her a couple, but as I reflect on that and this question, one of the superpowers I think that I have is I just, I'm a master at getting back up again. Like I just Mm. stumble and I get back up and I stumble and I get back up and I don't, and I don't even take the time to dust off. Do you know what I mean? It's like, okay, well, screw that up. Let's keep going. I screwed that up. Let's keep going. That is an Um, amazing superpower. That is an amazing. (laughs) Underestimated. (laughs) Because again, whether it's the first step or the next step, um, you, you, you have to take it. There's no other option. Um, I can think of one professional and one personal, and I'd love to share them both because I think yeah. they're, they're yes, impactful. please. Um, one pro- the one professional is that we and this one of the jobs of our marketing team is to help market our, our books, the books that Gary Keller writes, that he writes with Jay Papazan. And we ran, we would try to make these books bestsellers, right? Because that was yes. really a strategic goal for us. And, and for the team was to be able to say, this is a New York times bestseller, a wall street journal bestseller. Right. And for those who know that is no small task. You don't just launch a book and go and a million oh, people works. flood through yeah. your door. So we had a goal, set a goal to, to make the one thing a bestseller. And we were like, we're coming strong out of the gates. We're, we're doing this yep. and we hit it hard with marketing. We launched it on April 1st. I'll never forget. Right. We're like, I, re- <laughs> I remember sitting in that prep meeting in, um, in a like conference room in February before you guys launched in April. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, our first go, we didn't make it. I'm going to start over because once, once the book sales are counted, they're counted. You don't get to go back. Like once the bestseller hit uh, list hits, you don't get to go, but what about those books I sold last week? Yeah. Like, you know, and, and so we had to make a couple runs at that before we did it. And it tested our creativity, our ingenuity, my team leadership, our partnership with Jane Gary, right. Just to say like, okay, let's go at it again. Let's, let's make this book a bestseller. And now mm. we've gotten to the point where that book's taken on a life of its own, you know, but it wasn't, it wasn't always that way. Right. We really had to work at that. And the first time we went out, we failed just to make it. And so what what did you learn from that? You can always dig deeper. There's always another idea. There's always another way because you think you've just done everything. You think you've tapped every marketing idea you've got every creative, every creative idea you've got. But if you get the right people in a room and you think about the problem long enough, there will be a way. There will be a way. (laughs) And, and so again, it goes back to this, you got to have time on the task. You have to have time on the thinking and, and when you fail, just get back up and put in the time again. What's your personal one? Um, well, this is, I mean, this is a biggie and people would say this is not a failure, right? But, um, I really struggled with fertility. Um, that's been the story of my, the last five years of my life. I've had Mm -hmm. great professional, um, accomplishments, but I've had losses, you know, in trying to, to have this family that we dreamed of and wanted to start. And that is the hardest thing because it's, and this is why, because I always talk about like, get back up again, take some, take the next step. It is the only thing in your life as a woman, as a couple, however you're facing it, where you can't start again the next day. Yes. You can't. 
And the farther you go in age, the harder it gets. Right. And so then you have to make these huge decisions and you have to take the next step. And are we going to take the next step? And those are emotional decisions or financial decisions, Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, they're physical decisions, right? They're, they're so big and you don't just dust up and go for it the next day. (laughs) Like it's, and so those are, that was really the story of, of the last five years of my life was trying to, to build this family and build a career. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and how hard that was. And we got, so, you know, we took the next steps. We never lost faith in the journey. And I always say that people are like, how did you know you were going to, and we went all the way to IVF. Both my kids are IVF babies, you know, thank goodness for science. I love it. (laughs) Um, and I, I never thought of like, how far would I go? Yeah. I just thought, what's the next step? And am I ready to take it today? Because that, and that was our guiding light of like, okay, well, yeah, we are ready. We are ready. We are ready. And, and so, um, it's not my failure, you know, people would say that's, but it was the biggest disappointment to overcome. Right. Yeah. And, and, and to get the story through. of your perseverance. And I also find, you know, I've interviewed a lot of really successful people, Ellen and, and Seychelles too. And I found that it's a common way of thinking with successful people that it's a stay focused on the next step. Don't overwhelm yourself with, with, with the outcome. It's too much, right? Mm-hmm. We, it's mm-hmm. Monday. We focus on what we do on Mondays and yes. then it's Tuesday <laughs> we focus on what we yes. do on Mondays. Wow. Yeah, exactly. it, that's totally fair. So what, what advice would you have for someone that's starting out as a young executive and they're looking to grow? Mm-hmm. Well, I think we've, uh, you know, gosh, we've covered a lot of it, right? So I mm-hmm. would say, uh, number one is, um, be strategic about where you go to grow yourself. Uh, either be really bought it. You've got to ask questions about leadership, about culture and about financials and the financial yeah. future and the plan. Like if I yeah. were to look back, I would be looking at the person interviewing me and say, okay, what's the plan to grow this company? <laughs> right? <laughs> and do you believe that that is a valid plan? Right. And, and, and not everybody, ha- that's a privilege to be able to ask that question. Right. To say, yeah. right. But, but if you're in a position where you can go out and you can evaluate opportunities and really then, then try to find a place or get somewhere, get some money coming in and then try to strategically go out and build the relationships right. that are going to get you to be in a position to ask those questions. Right. Take us, take a seat on a rocket ship, find a seat on a rocket ship, because if you get in on that rocket ship, it's going to grow. Yeah. Um, and your opportunity will grow with it. And then, and then the second, I think is exactly what we're talking about is just focus on the next step and doing the hard work and doing mm-hmm. the lonely work because more gets done when, you know, sometimes in those lonely hours for that are going to grow you and grow your professional opportunity than what's going to be done with the team. Right. Like yeah. the doing the lonely work and doing that, whether you work five days, whether you work an extra hour every day or you work six days, it, it doesn't matter, but you're going to have to do some of that lonely work to get ahead because mm-hmm. make no mistake. Everything's a competition. Everything. Yeah. And you got to get ahead somehow. Well, and you're not competitive. No, Ellen's not competitive <laughs> no, <well>. at all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ellen, in all that, what do you think are the most important habits that you've cultivated? Um, I think there are, I think there are daily habits and then I think there are, are bigger things that I just incorporate kind of as life habits that I try to make sure and, and always come back to one is I really flounder when I'm not taking care of myself physically, which mm-hmm. by the way, has been a challenge and uh, in having babies and <laughs> starting a family. Right. So, yeah. so I went from, you know, doing, CrossFit and, you know, all these kind of things taking my career. And didn't you do Olympic weightlifting at one point? Yes, I did. Uh-huh. I thought so. I told Mia that. I was like, I remember you told me that. And I was like, I'm sorry. I've what never are you doing? Question, like, what are your <laughs> habits? I've never asked it and had someone say Olympic weightlifting. <laughs> I've never been an answer I've seen. I was really trying to like get into Olympic weightlifting. This was like a real thing. And I loved it because I, because I think I had this deep, like, itch that needs to be scratched of like anger or like throwing around heavy <sighs> things or like yeah. flipping a tire. <laughs> like I'm, I'm that person. Like I'm the person that eventually has to go outside and like scream, like I or, yeah. or cry or whatever. Yeah. Like I have to have some like deep itch scratched, you know, yeah. it's like, ah. so, um, I think that really did it for me. Um, uh, but 
now I have to get up at four o'clock to go to the gym. Yeah. You know, like now I have to make that. And so that extends my day, but I got to figure out a way to make that a priority. So having that habit, because I need that release, I need something that feels really yeah. hard and I can go, okay, I'm exhausted. I'm tired. Like, let's move on. Um, so I think that's an important habit. I think I am an alone, I recharge alone. So having alone time reading, I would love to sit here and tell you, like I read all the nonfiction books. I do not. I read fiction. <laughs> when I go to bed at night, I'm not picking up, you know, the, the, the greatest leadership book. I do read those. I do listen to audible. I do all that. But when I sit down at night to unplug, I'm reading trash novels. Like I'm reading. <laughs> hey, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. That's a good habit, actually. Yeah. But I have to, um, I have to think about something else. Do you know what I mean? I, I have to unplug and just be like, this is not reality. Like <laughs> this is something totally silly. And then I have to get out. I have to travel. I have to see the world because we have to remember that this is all bigger than ourselves. Because if you can remember that it is yeah. all bigger than you and even your fan, like your little speck of what you're trying to control and what you're trying to run, like it just, it humbles and puts you, I feel like in the right mind space to be of service mm -hmm. to others because, and to be a leader of others, because you're like, you know what, I, I can't possibly be the most important thing. And you see, you just see further than yourself. And I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. I love that. So the, the travel piece actually takes me to my, my last question for you, which is, uh, what's on your vision board that nobody knows about? Oh God. I don't have anything really spectacular to share there. I will say I, I was, it has been on my vision board and when I was actually planning with my family um, and we're talking at a time during COVID-19, mm -hmm. right? We know this won't exist forever, but I was planning a trip with my mom, my dad, and my family to go to Turkey. Mm. Um, I really, that's a place that I want to go. Um, and again, I, I just want to be someplace that uh, we always try to pick places that most people don't go. Absolutely. Or, because I want to know, I want to know things that other people don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. So I would say traveling there. Um, I, I had a long time, you know, I had babies and all that kind of stuff on my vision board. I'm done with yeah. having babies, I'm, mm -hmm. you know, but um, I, I'm going to continue to travel and continue to get out there. Um, I, I, I think, uh, yeah. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> it's phenomenal, by the way. I love Turkey. It's one of my favorite countries and it's so vast and varied and it's, it's a great, mm -hmm. it's a great and worthy vision board. Mm -hmm. well, Ellen Curtis, Vice President of Operations at Keller Williams mm -hmm. International, largest real estate company in the world. We are honored that you gave us the time today oh. to let us interview you. And I, I just feel like we really got, got behind the curtain insight on, on the journey to your, you know, your executive mm -hmm. path journey. And then also thank you for sharing about your, your fertility struggles, which so many women, so many women relate to, and it's just not yes. talked about a lot. And so thank you for sharing that. And, and it's really cool because now we're seeing the, you know, a, a great result of that, right? You've got two beautiful children and a, and a happy marriage. And this is the, this is just the midpoint of your career, my friend. It's going to be fun to watch, mm -hmm. you keep going and hopefully grow with our company. And for all of you listeners, join us next time. We're going we're gonna to be here in the same place wherever you subscribe and listen to your podcast. And thank you so much. We want you to go lead a big business and an even bigger life. And just remember, you are an empire builder. Thanks for joining. <laughs>